Well, good morning. Welcome to Providence United Methodist Church. Welcome to this service, the 11 a.m. service. My name is Casey Crimmins. I am the Director of Evangelism and Discipleship for the church with main responsibilities lying around uh, leading and preaching in the net, which is our contemporary service going on right now. Uh, but I relish in these opportunities to come over here to be with you. It's like having family, like on the other side of the country that you just don't get to see, but you want to see. That's what it feels like this morning. So I'm just so delighted uh, to be with you. Pastor Dave and Brian Mateer, who's our director of missions, is suffering for the Lord in southern Italy right now. No, they, uh, they are on an exploratory mission trip where they're looking at a possible partnership that we, Providence, might have with some things that are going on there. So I want us to make sure we are mindful of that this morning. This week he'll be gone and then he'll get back like Saturday, jet lagged, rolling here, and he'll be back with us next week. But please be praying for them as they explore God's heart and our possible partnership with them. So we're in the middle of a series, a series uh, that we've called Stargazers. And it's, and it's taking a moment as a church, a, a, the total church, taking a moment and starting to look up. Take a season to look up. Because, man, we spend a lot of time looking down. And, and understandably so, we have our financial issues, we have our failed relationships, we have the just doldrums of life that are just, just surrounding us. And we thought, wouldn't it be a good idea for just a season and just start looking up? And, you know, you try to relate that to what else are you looking up at that you might uh, wonder at. And maybe not even notice they're there until you actually look up. So, stars. We're stargazing. And we started this uh, several weeks ago, and Dave and I both preached on uh, Psalm 115. And took a moment to lay the foundation of why this is so important. So important for us to gather around Scripture and go, God, reveal yourself. Tell, tell us who you are. Because the warning is that we will mold ourselves, we're warned in Scripture, we will mold ourselves in the likeness of the God that we think He is. So it's so important for us to gaze upon Scripture and take a moment to look up. We talked about a God that was unchanging. Just un immutable was the word, but unchanging. And how faithful He is. Last week we talked about His independence his independence, that he stands just so uh, apart and in need of nothing. And how good that is. What good news that is for us. This week, we're going to tackle something uh, that I feel is pretty big. Something I've struggled and wrestled with as I prepared. Something heavy. That's God's holiness. And not that we're going to get it in like 20 minutes. Not that we're going to walk out of here like experts in it. But I'm going to pray, man, that Lord would show up in power and move and, and maybe awaken us afresh to him. So would you bow your heads with me and let's pray. Holy Father, Lord, we pray to you this morning. We ask you to come and move in power. Lord, we thank you for your scripture. We thank you that it's true and it reveals who you are, that we can look to it. And see you. Father, that you'd move in power, that your Holy Spirit would be present this morning. Moving and doing something new and significant. Dust off cobwebs. Remove complacency. And allow us to enter in with you this morning. We need your mercy and we need your grace. So we thank you for your son Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray these things. Amen. All right, I'm going to reread a, a bit of the scripture that Teresa just read, just to keep it fresh. And if you have your Bible in front of you, you brought one today, you want to crack that thing open, maybe you got a, an app on your phone. There's Wi-Fi in here, just so you guys know. Don't play games, but there's Wi-Fi. Okay, open that up. We're going to read through Isaiah chapter 6. Now, Isaiah is about midway through the Bible, Old Testament. I'm a little particular. Isaiah is my son's name, so I kind of like this book. But anyway, uh, chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 3. All right, it says, And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the king. 
the Lord Almighty. So if you were to take a look at, at Scripture, man, just read that thing cover to cover for a moment. It would take you a little bit more than a moment. But if you read it through and you looked for some of the common strands uh, all the way through, there, there are several, but one of them that I'd want to lay before you this morning is this idea of God's holiness. All right, if you even looked at the beginning of the beginning, like Genesis 3, what's the reason that we got thrown out of the garden? All right, we're in perfect, holy communion with the Lord, and what do we do? We sin. And that then separates us from his holiness. God's like, man, you can't be in this anymore, so he kicks us out and separates us. And then as you continue forward, a, a few chapters later, God is residing over the earth. He comes and talks to Noah, and he says, Noah, man, this whole earth is just wicked. There, there's just wickedness everywhere. My, my holiness, like, I can't even find it down here. I am going to cleanse this thing, and I'm going to use you and your family. I'm going to press the restart button because uh, my holiness, man, it's gone down here. And then we continue forward. Abraham. God comes to Abraham and then uses Abraham and all his descendants and makes a nation and says, I'm going to use you to put myself on display, my holiness, but you got to be holy. you got to put this thing on display for me. Then we see uh, the judges and the prophets all throughout the Old Testament. What, what is their constant call to the Israelites? Constantly just come back and going, guys, repent, stop this, come back to the holy God that t rescued you. Come back. Repent of that. Turn away from that. Come back to who you were created by him to be. This constant renewal of holiness that was necessary. We see the word holy uh, in the Old New Testament 551 times. A common theme. And yet, I, I feel when there's something that recurs that much, a lot of times we get numb to it because we just see it everywhere. Man, Holy Scripture, Holy Communion, Holy Spirit. We just tag that on to anything Christian and we're like, okay, that must be what it is. But, but what I want to do this morning is I've studied, is I've just taken time to go, Lord, what does this really mean? I want to start just by defining it. Let's just define it for what it is. Look back to the Hebrew and then I'm going to ask some questions of us this morning as it relates to this Scripture. So if we start with a definition, uh, if you look at Webster's Dictionary, something like that, it would say dedicated, something that's holy, dedicated or consecrated to God or religious purpose, semicolon, sacred. So basically they, they took a, a, a religious word and then described it with a bunch of religious words. They're like, okay, here's what it is, but it's kind of just all these things religious. So you got to kind of peel it back a little bit. So the her, original Hebrew word for holy was kadoyish. Kadoyesh. You're never going to use this again, but maybe you will. Maybe you want to tell someone you're really smart. Kadoyesh was holy. But, but here's the, the, the interesting part with the definition, how they teased this thing out. It actually didn't have like a root word. Like a lot of times in Hebrew you can go back to, well, it was kind of like this. It didn't have that. It was a word that stood all on its own. However, and if you look in your reference Bibles, a lot of time it'll put this word right next to this, this word called Kadesh. I would say it's kind of similar to that because Kadesh was the closest thing that it sounded like. And it was, the definition of Kadesh was cut, separate, cut apart. So this idea of holy, as it was understood back then, as, as they were looking at, meant to cut apart, to separate apart, to put this stuff over here and leave this beautiful, pure here. 1 Samuel 2.2 says this, there is no one holy like the Lord. There's no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Meaning, there's no one like, even like in parallel, in stature, in grandeur, in characteristics. There's no one like him. He is holy. He is set apart. Cut apart. He is holy because he is separate distinct from, from us in who he is. So that's holiness. 
So here's some questions I want to ponder. I'm going to ask us three questions to ponder, and I'm going to spoiler alert this real quick. I'm not going to give you the full answer. All right, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, expound upon you every crevice of this thing because I think what, what we're called to do sometimes is engage our, our minds and sometimes make the 12-inch journey from our minds to our hearts and see where this thing might hit this morning. So, so have some grace with me because I'll tell you what, I, I don't even get this to the extent of, of what maybe uh, it's, it's actually like warranted. to get. I, I don't get it. But I think it's okay. And I think it's okay for us to aspire to want to, but to also understand that in our humility, we're never going to get there. All right, so three questions to ponder just as we look at this. How is God defined? How is God defined in, in this scripture? Holy, holy, holy. All right, Isaiah's brought to this throne room, the throne room of God. Right, he's, he's in there and these like seraphim like flying around. By the way, the transition of seraphim, they're, they're like angels. It's like flaming beings. So just this in fuego flying around. He's in there and they're tossing back and forth, just chanting out this idea of holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And as they do that, the, the, the door, put, like, like things are shaking. The, the doorposts and thresholds are shaking. Like, imagine you're in a thunderstorm, right? The lightning and thunder, when they show up at the same time, like lightning and the thunder, it like shakes your house. That's what he's experiencing. And what are they saying? What are they repeating three times? Well, of, of all the traits that God has, the hundred and something traits that we could put around God's attributes, what are they repeating three times? Sometimes we miss this because it's so natural to us. Is it merciful, merciful? Merciful, mighty, 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 good, good, graceful. I mean, no. Holy, holy, holy. It's nice to know that, that God in his immutability, his unchangingness, we have this picture that, we're given, that was given to Isaiah of the throne room hundreds of years before this guy named John shows up and writes book after revelation that he has in the throne room. And guess what John reports there singing out? Holy, holy, holy. So if that's what's happening, and, and, and they're repeating it three times. Now a lot of scholars will say, well, it's holy for the Father, holy for the Son, and holy Spirit. And, and, and while I get that, I don't think they get like jealous if we left one out. I, I think there's something else going on in the Hebrew culture when they're using repeating words or repeating rhythms. There's something else going on. And when they're repeating holy, 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 I don't see it as one holy plus one holy equals two plus one more is three. There's an explan exponentialization that takes place. That one holy to the next holy is like ten holies. And then we're like, hey, that doesn't do it. We got to get one more in here. And then take us to the hundredth because that's how holy he is. Holy, holy, holy. That's how they describe him. So then the second question, what's the response what response do we see uh, take place? Because there's two separate, distinct uh, entities in this story. One I already talked about, the seraphim. Okay, again, these just, we don't get it. Okay, seraphim are these angelic beings. And any time in the scripture that the angelic shows up on the scene, the first thing, one of the first things they have to say to whoever they're interacting with is, fear not. Like, calm down. I know I'm like super intimidating, but just relax. I got, I got a mesh this for you, or whatever it is, which leads me to believe they're probably pretty intimidating. Okay? Like, flame. These guys got six wings just flowing around, and they're yelling so loud that the place is shaking. I'm guessing they're pretty intimidating. And what do they do? What is their response? A, we have the, what words they're saying, but, but think about this. They have six wings, and with two of them, they cover their face. And I just see that as, like, Lord, man, I, I can't even look at you. I can't even take this thing in. This is just crazy that, that you're here. Like, my eyeballs might get, like, burned out if I open them. And then they take the other ones, and they cover their feet. Now, this might get lost on us a little bit in, you know, 2015, but there was a lot of symbology around the feet. I mean, think about Moses. He's talking to the holy bush, the, the burning bush. 
And what does the burning bush like tell him? Take off your sandals, because the ground you stand on is holy. So I see this as just reverence. These, these huge angelic beings just, just covering and covering. And then we see Isaiah. One of my favorite responses, one of my favorite verses. Woe to me. Woe to me. I am ruined before you, God. I'm ruined. Now, there's New Living Translations and messages that are trying to, you know, give us, like, what would we be saying? And they're basically like, oh my goodness, I can't even handle this right now. Like, I am undone right now. I'm going to come apart. I'm going to explode. Like, it's all over for me. It's over. I'm done. I'm probably not going to make it out. To me. That's his response of just, God, I can't even take you in right now. Like, it's just too much for me. And we see some other responses, some other moments in time throughout Scripture where, where the holy of holies interacts with people. Uh, Moses, Moses hid his face. Joshua fell face down. Habakkuk is talking about it. He says, when the Lord is present, the whole earth is to be silent. Be silent. Almost like, guys, like, shh, do you know anything? Like, shh. I can't take, I can't even understand this. Daniel face turned deathly pale, fell to the ground speechless, and barely able to breathe. Okay, that's Daniel, the one like hung out with lions, and he's undone before the Lord. And John, uh, we're, we're given the picture that he is, uh, falls to his feet as if he were dead. That was some of their responses to just the holy presence of holy. When we're confronted with God's holiness, it's, it's unsettling. It's like unnerving. And why, why do you think that is? Why do you think there's a bit of unnervedness in the holy presence of the holy of holy of holies? Well, Isaiah says it. What's the first thing he notices? The first thing he notices, he's in the, I'm, I'm going to die. And then basically goes, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm unclean. Next to your holiness next to who you are man i am filthy i am filthy and, and I'm, I'm i'm part of people that are filthy too a nation of unclean lips that's what he notices i mean okay think about this so i, I don't know how many of you do laundry in your households my wife and i like to share that duty uh they, a lot of times th there's like color safe bleach the color safe bleach which to me is like an oxymoron but anyway so you got your nice polo like nice Blue, purple, yellow, whatever polo you decide to wear. And maybe you're taking your kid or going with some family friends to a haunted house that has a black light. Well, you roll in there feeling pretty good about yourself. And then all of a sudden that black light. Sweetheart. Safe bleach. But, but up until that moment, you didn't know. Right, you're on the sunlight, which is really bright, but yet everything kind of feels okay, and you're doing okay, and things look okay. But then you bring that black light, which brings out that reflection. That shirt ain't clean anymore. In the same way, that's what happens with our boy Isaiah. Even in his holiness, even in, in the role that he's called to play, he goes, Lord, I am a man of unclean lips. I'm undone. So the third question what is our true call in response to God's holiness? What is our true call and response? I'm going to read some scripture. This comes out of Leviticus. This is Moses. He's taking him out. He's, you know, going through the desert and probably at Mount Sinai. Kind of, hey, this is the new marching or this is how we're going to roll. This is some of the things that he's given from the Lord. Leviticus 11, 44 and 45. I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore be holy, which we know means set apart. Be set apart because I am set apart. Holy. Leviticus 20, uh, nine chapters later, Leviticus 20, 26, because God likes to repeat things that are important. 20, 26 says, you are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am 
holy, and I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. So he even says that I'm setting you apart. He like reveals, hey, you're holy. Be holy as I'm as holy. But why? What was, what was being talked about just before? They, they were in bondage. They were in enslaved by Egyptians. And God in his amazing might and through incredible circumstances delivers them out of this. Out of their slavery, out of their bondage, out of their just going nowhere situation. Delivers them out of that into there and he says, now, this me who's done this, I am calling you to be set apart as I am set apart to put this on display to the nations. To fulfill what I talked to about, about to your like forefathers, forefather Abraham, that promise, I'm doing it right now. But you got to be holy like I'm holy. And we go, man, that's Old Testament. It's Old Testament, Casey. But I question, and I see this God that is unchanging, and then I see Jesus. And I see Jesus come and put something on display for us, show us something, and welcome us into something through a grand act of the Father, through the Son, now gives us access to be delivered from our sin, delivered from our bondage, and then set apart for him. What's the down payment when we believe, when we confess with our mouths and we repent and believe? What's the down payment? The Holy Spirit placed within you to then be called apart to put God on display. This concept, this idea of, of being set apart, this holiness of God, uh, we're just never going to get. I said this uh, in the 8.30, and then I was thinking about this. This morning I woke up. I don't know how many of you were up at around 7, 7.30, but the sunrise this morning was incredible. Anybody see the sunrise this morning? Anybody up at 7, 7? This is 11 o'clock. Like, we weren't up there. We got up 20 minutes ago. Okay, some of you. It was breathtaking. It was I, c I couldn't, I couldn't get, I, I had to take a picture, obviously, take a picture. And then put it on Instagram, and you're like, amazing, hashtag no filter. Like, this was just how it was. And I was showing someone that, that picture this morning. And it's a little box, right? It's a little box, a little, little snapshot. It will get nowhere close to describing the splendor and the beauty of that sunrise this morning. Get nowhere close. I can't describe the hues of the pink and the red and the yellow. I can't describe what exactly it was and how the clouds were set up. I think that's the same when we talk about this type of stuff. We gaze upon it. And then we go, God, what does that mean for me? What does that mean for me that you are holy? And that you call me to be holy and set apart. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Almighty. Amen.